Welcome. We're in video 13. We're still in week three. Our treatment of tradition continues. And we're talking about the content now of tradition. Prior to the Second Vatican Council, how did people think of tradition? And Vatican II is pretty much it has this in mind, how, how people thought of tradition. And there are basically two extremes that the council was trying to navigate between. The first is the idea of tradition as stable content. So as the church comes through time, there's more and more added <laughs> to the, 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 the legacy of tradition. Um, and Trent spoke not of tradition with a capital T with a sing in the singular, but of traditions. And the traditions are assumed to be various doctrines that maybe not be clearly in the New Testament, for example, like the Assumption or the Immaculate Conception, um, various stories, various customs, practices. The Rosary is a tradition. Various devotions are traditions. Okay, so um, that would be the idea of, you know, multiple uh, bits of content that are passed on orally and through life that aren't found in Scripture. That's one idea. The, the, some neo-scholastics, not Trent though, thought of tradition as a collection of all such traditions outside of Scripture. Again, Trent really didn't say much except to defend, yes, traditions are important that they are a norm against the Protestant attack. So it didn't explain a whole lot and teach a whole lot about it. Okay, so the theologians after Trent, you know, they came up with this very um, uh, uh, objective idea of tradition as a collection of things not found in the New Testament. Okay. Um, and some of them saw this as an independent source of revelation. This is what Dave Verbum in Vatican II wants to say, no, it's not an independent source, okay? But it also wants to change this idea that it's simply a collection of different practices. But anyway, I wanna just talk about people today who are called traditionalists. Traditionalists would take an extreme approach to this view of tradition as stable content, and uh, they would see all received doctrines and customs, all the way <clears throat> particularly through the 1950s, as something that you keep, they're all on the same level. Uh, they speak as if the usages of the 19th century and the 1950s were, had existed from the beginning. All right, so there's no, this is kind of a Catholic traditional fundamentalism where there's no sense of historical context and various practices, no sense of differentiation between something that is, you know, a recent uh, devotional tradition from something that is an ancient apostolic tradition. What's a good example of an apostolic tradition? Well, the fathers said infant baptism was an apostolic tradition. They said the apostles taught the church that. The sign of the cross. Uh, the fathers said it was an apostolic tradition, and evidence seems to point that it is. You see certain reflections of it even in Revelation. All the 144,000, they're dressed in white. Sounds like baptism, right? And they have the name of God and of the Lamb on their forehead. Well, it seems that we're talking about the seal of the sign of the cross that went on the forehead. And it, that's the way the fathers saw this. And I think historical critical scholars would say that's a very strong, maybe not absolutely done deal sort of factual interpretation, but it's a very probable interpretation of what we see in the visions of Revelation, that the sign of the cross was happening as part of baptism, even in the time of the New Testament. But anyway, the fathers certainly thought it was an apostolic tradition. And, you know, since it was preserved everywhere in all the different rites of the church, going back to the earliest evidence, we, I would say that's a good sign that it's apostolic tradition. It's universal. It's found everywhere from the ancient church on our earliest records up till now. Okay, what's well, not an apostolic tradition? Well, the rosary is a good example. As we have it, um, a rosary is a devotional tradition that goes back to, uh, as we have it, only the 16th century. Okay, if you read Thomas Aquinas' uh, commentary on the Hail Mary, you'll find out the second part of the Hail Mary was not known in the time of Thomas Aquinas. The Hail Mary itself as a prayer evolved from the angel's declaration to Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Then adding Elizabeth's greeting to Mary, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And then adding the word Jesus and then adding Holy Mary, mother of God, which isn't from the scriptures, it's from the liturgy. Anyway, my point is there are human traditions 
that don't start with the apostles in Christ that are um, part of this whole legacy. And a lot of times you find traditionalists um, wanting to preserve all of that and kind of seeing all of that as of equal value and, and equal, uh, equally Catholic, you know? Uh, it's, it'd be hard for some traditionalists to think about, you know, the early church fathers, you know, for the first three, 400 years, for sure, people were receiving communion in the hand. Uh, we have ample evidence of that. Communion of the tongue was not known. So it would shock a lot of people today. And, you know, it's not Catholic to do such a thing. Well, there you go. You know, the early church fathers didn't, uh, didn't pray the rosary. The rosary wasn't known. They had a great devotion to Mary, though, but didn't pray the rosary. So, I mean, uh, th what I'm trying to say is uh, you can get into the stable content in a very wooden way where everything is of the same value. Uh, and you harden everything and nothing can be changed without it being a betrayal of the Catholic heritage and the Catholic tradition. And you'll find plenty of people saying stuff like this on Twitter and Facebook. Okay, so um, if you want to get a good little bead on this, take a look at Henri de Lubac. De Lubac is an amazing historical theologian, deeply spiritual man. He, before the council, as many of you know, was actually um, disciplined uh, there were some very conservative curial theologians and cardinals who thought he was a modernist. And so uh, the Jesuits removed him from his teaching position. They also removed uh, the, the Dominicans at the same time removed Eve Congar. Now, both of those men were invited by John XXIII to be part of the preparatory commission for the council. Both of them were invited to be periti or expert advisors during the council. Both of them had great impact on writing some of the council documents. And then after the council, John Paul II, to express just how valuable their teaching was, he made them cardinals. When a priest is made a cardinal, a priest theologian, it means that they are very, very uh, important teachers of the Catholic faith who, to whom the church owes a great debt. So that's what that means. Um, so anyway, uh, Henri de Lubac, thinking about, he, he himself was involved in this battle. You know, the battle that always goes on between conservatives and progressives and whatever you want to call these different camps. But the traditionalists of his day, he said, they really shouldn't be called traditionalist because the tradition is a life-giving force. And uh, I'm for, and a lot of us are for, making progress by going back to the earliest stages of the tradition and reacquainting ourselves with the fathers and the scriptures. These folks who call themselves traditionalists, he would call conservatives. In the time of the 1950s, the conservatives wanted to hold on to everything the way it was in the 1950s. They wanted to preserve the status quo. Today, many of the folks who want to go back to the 1950s, and typically that's called being reactionary, trying to bring back an earlier form of government or society, hearkening back to that period as a golden age and wanting to bring it back. Um, so anyway, I just want to make the point that, you know, calling someone a traditionalist begs the question of what really is tradition? What is the Catholic tradition? And that's exactly what Vatican II wanted to help teach us and the catechism also following the council. So some folks think of tradition as a collection of stable content that comes to us that's not in the New Testament. Well, Protestants, many of them would say, yeah, exactly, that's right, that's why we reject it, because it's not in the New Testament. <laughs> it's a bunch of human distraction. Okay, so some conservatives and Protestants are operating on, on the same idea uh, of what tradition is. Some people came along in the 19th century, early 20th century, who had a completely different idea of tradition. And they were called modernists. Generally speaking, all, all the modernists who thought about tradition had at least one similar idea. And that is that tradition is a dynamic process. Now the extreme modernists would say, it's a dynamic process alone. There's no stable content that binds us uh, it's just uh, the, uh, the process whereby a new generation is introduced to the achievements and, and, and the knowledge and the experience of the past generation, and their job is to take it to another level. Uh, and they're not really obliged to hold on to the starting point of the previous generation or what they've received, okay? So they're, they, they're supposed to, there's an idea, you know, evolution was a big idea in the 19th century. So the idea of these folks is, 
tradition is about an evolution of Christianity. And in the minds of the radical modernists condemned by um, Pope Pius X, for their, their idea was that truth could change, relativism. And so really our morality today, for example, has, we have no obligation to um, be faithful to New Testament ethics because that's just a function of its time and place. So this historicism involved in some of this radical side of, uh, of the idea of tradition as a process alone Okay, so for, th for these folks, and this includes, uh, one thing I'll just say, Blondell, who is Orthodox, and these other folks who are not Orthodox, one thing they had in common is they saw that tradition is actually innovative. Okay, in other words, it's, it's a creative force. All right, is that true? Well, we'll see what Vatican II has to say about it and, and later theologians who, lean, who, who um, you know, weigh this. And try, to, and try to assess this movement. All right. So the modernists who are condemned, there's no stable content. And that's an extreme. So the, a lot of folks previous to the modernists, it's all stable content. And we've got to hold on to it exactly the way we get it. And it keeps growing as things are passed on. Uh, we can't change any of it. That, that would be one extreme. And then the other extreme would be it's a process and there's no stable content. Okay, so this, uh, we, 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 there are some notes here where actually John Paul II references some of these things in his writings. So there are some quotes from the Christian faith you're assigned to read that show you John Paul II's awareness of, of these, both of these concepts and how he's trying to, following Vatican II, he's trying to bring us beyond this either or extremism. All right, so what's the opposite of either or? Both and often said that, you know, Protestantism is a relationship of either, is a religion of either or. Faith or works, you know? <laughs> gr gr uh, uh, so uh, grace or, uh, or free will, you know, f you know, that kind of thing. So uh, in the Catholic Church, we say faith and works are important, you know? Uh, re faith and reason. So we're, we're kind of the both and uh, church and tradition. So when it comes down to this assessment of of um, tradition, Maurice Blondel is a very, very important source. And what he really does is he analyzes tradition as a human experience. You know, uh, hum humanity, uh, nature is very important. God created nature. The way human beings are is a reflection of the way God created us. And grace doesn't destroy nature or ignore it. It builds on it and transforms it. So what Blondel does is that he puts, he kind of analyzes the natural experience of human tradition, okay? Uh, and and he is, he's followed by some great theologians in the 20th century, people like Congar, Yves Congar, who we see is very important in the council. Congar would go on to write the section in De Verbum on tradition. Uh, he wrote it, of course, it's all voted on and various bishops make interventions, say change this word, change that. But, but Congar was the one who kind of penned the original paragraphs, you know, and helped to rewrite the section after it was debated, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, Avery Dulles leans heavily on Blondell. Uh, I did a lot of research on Blondell and on tradition in my graduate work. Okay, so he, what does Blondell say? He says it is rich content. The old school people are right. It's a rich content, but it's handed on by a dynamic process. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of an image that's used by many writers regarding tradition, and that is a river. So think of a river and the way that it carries us forward. So it's progressive, yet it connects us with the source. All right? So it keeps us connected. There's continuity, but there's movement forward. Beautiful image. Again, we're using an image, all analogies limp, but this is a really good image because there's a lot of great ideas here, a lot of reasons why uh, it's a good image. That's one of them. Another one is a river gives life. Well, tradition is life-giving. It's a wellspring of life for the church. It's not a, just a collection of antiquities. You know, it's not a museum. So that, that's said, by the way, by John the 23rd. Um, and, you know, there's beautiful quotes on tradition. Uh, I'll try to assemble some of uh, them and put them in the course materials for you guys. Um, okay, it's enriched by tributaries. There's water that flows into a river, so as it gets further from the source, it's enriched. So the Catholic Church has always understood that, yes, there is growth and dynamism in tradition, both 
we, we understand things better, that's development of doctrine, but also the riches of the world come in. If you remember Origen, second century, he's the first one we know of who says that when Israel was called to leave Egypt, the Lord told them, go ask your neighbors and they'll give you gifts. And so they brought gold from the Egyptians out into the, the desert and then ultimately to the promised land. Well, Origen says that the good philosophy of the ancient world, the good that's in Plato and others, that belongs to us. That's the gold of the Gentiles, the gold of the nations, the gold of the Egyptians. So uh, much of this gold comes in, you know, great ideas from the history of, of, of uh, philosophy, uh, practices. You know, there's a lot, of, a lot of infusions of culture that comes into the church from the various nations that are baptized. And a lot of their customs had to be left at the door, but there's a lot of beautiful customs and ideas and art. For example, all the different art forms. You know, you have icons from the East, uh, they come into the tradition from Byzantine culture. You get the magnificent uh, arching cathedrals of the Gothic period and the stained glass. You know, this all becomes, this, these are tributaries coming in from culture, various cultures that enrich the Catholic tradition. Okay, you can swim in the tradition. It can hold you up. It can buoy you. And that's a beautiful image as well. We're all immersed in the tradition if we're living in it. And th here's the other thing on the negative side. A river can be muddied, and a river can get silted up with debris. And so that also gives us an idea that sometimes traditions that are in the tradition need to be critiqued. Sometimes it needs to be dredging. Sometimes it needs to be purification. So the idea that tradition sometimes needs to be uh, changed or examined or purified, that is actually in this in image of a river, okay? So here's the thing that Blondell is very aware of. He analyzes action, human action, and he notices something, and that is that things, we know a lot of things that we can't exactly explain. And I'll just give you an example of that. Try to explain to somebody how to drive a car. You can't learn how to drive a car from reading the manual. You learn how to drive a car by watching someone drive it, then trying to drive it themselves and scaring to death the person who's sitting next to you who's trying to supervise you. And then you, you learn, like, how do you know when to switch gears in a manual? Okay? Well, ultimately, you learn the feel, and you can't really describe it to anyone. You just know the feel. Uh, the same thing with how hard to press on the brake pedal or how, how hard to press what, you know, uh, just think about all this. Um, the first time you tried to drive in this oncoming traffic going, you know, 50 miles an hour and the only thing separating you is a orange line, you're scared to death, but ultimately you get the hang of it and then it becomes second nature. But you really can't explicitly explain how you know how to stay in the lines and you know how you know how how hard to push on the gas pedal, when to turn. You know these are all things that become part of you in action as you act it out. Same thing is true, honestly, for learning a skill or a craft. Riding a bike. Okay, how do you explain to somebody how to ride a bike? No, you, you know how to balance a bike. You can't quite explain it. But how? To, but it's all about an action. In our life, there are things that we do that we know that we can't reduce to explicit knowledge. And we pass these on and initiate other people into learning how to do them by watching us, then watching them and giving them some coaching. But, you know, and there's a process of passing on knowledge. Language is a great example of this. None of us learned language, honestly, by sitting in a classroom and studying English grammar. Uh, you're listening to this lecture in English, so I assume you know English. But when you learned English, you most probably learned it as a baby. Be, and how did you learn it? Before you ever went to school. Just being immersed in it and trying and speaking and imitating and listening. And actually, you know English grammar um, rules without being able to verbalize them. And today, you've studied them, a lot of you, and a lot of you still can't verbalize them. You know, what's an infinitive? When's the right time to use a participle in the right place? What's a dangling participle? What's a split infinitive? You don't know that stuff. When do you say, uh, how do you d describe when to say I and me? You know, you know to say uh, that it's not right to say me go to the store now. You know, babies say that, we laugh, but if adults say that, we know it's wrong. You know, we learn through experience, through immersion in an experience. We learn the, the rules of language, but we can't really explain them unless we have studied lots of foreign languages or we teach English or something, you know? So the point uh, that Blondell, he's analyzing human experience and he's saying that 
tradition, human tradition, passes on things like language. Okay, you can't reduce it to explicit knowledge. Uh, you can't explain it. You can't put it all into writing. I mean, there is a manual that tells you how to drive a car, but you read that manual, you don't know how to drive a car. You've got to actually go do it, and hopefully you have some guidance with somebody who knows how to do it. So anyway, this is a human reality. And it's, Blondel has a long thesis called l'action, or action, human action, and how action passes on knowledge that we can't quite explain. Okay, another guy comes along in the 20th century, Michael Polanyi, and he calls this tacit knowledge, things that we know, attitudes, you know, perspectives, um, uh, just ways of looking at things, frames of reference. We pick these things up and we know them, but we can't quite explain them. Well, this is very important, and Blondel applies this to tradition. He says, tradition is not just collection of ideas and practices and writings. It's much more than that, and that's why we need it, because it communicates something that writing alone can't communicate. It communicates a whole life. It communicates this tacit dimension, this implicit knowledge, this way of looking at things, this attitude, this frame of reference, you know? And we communicate that from generation to generation through tradition. That's natural. And the Holy Spirit takes that and guides that. And through the, also the help of apostolic succession, we keep on track. And we keep on, you know, the, the apostolic tradition stays and continues. Even though it grows and develops, it still brings us all the way back to the source. And it brings us something that can't be brought by writings alone or explicit knowledge. And that's why it's so important. Okay, so this is a great contribution philosophically by a man who, who himself is a Catholic and makes the theological application. He's not a professional theologian, he's a professional philosopher, but he sees how this applies to tradition. This is around 1900 that he writes this stuff, okay? So, what is the content? It's intimate, lived, implicit, tacit knowledge of the risen Lord, transmitted from generation to generation. It includes the whole experience, the entire memory of the church, attitudes. It it's provides a frame of reference, okay? The scriptures came out of it. The scriptures can only be fully understood against its backdrop, backdrop okay? So, tradition imparts a skill. The, the tradition, the apostolic tradition, imparts a skill. Ital the tradition of Italian cooking imparts a skill. You don't learn it from recipes. Sorry, you gotta, you gotta cook with somebody. You gotta live in a home. You gotta know what it's supposed to taste like, you know? Um, and, and you cook with people and you stand next to them. You know, the, my Italian relatives never wrote down recipes. When I learned to cook, I stood by their side and I did write down little index card recipes as notes, but fundamentally they said, put in a few fingers, a couple of, just put in a pinch of that, put in a pinch of this. Uh, how much? No, just a pinch, two fingers. That's what my grandmother used to say, two fingers. Well, you kind of learn the feel, just like driving a car, in living in that kind of tradition, what things are supposed to taste like and how to put them together. And the only way to really pick that up right is by, you know, living in it. Okay, but the, the Christian tradition, going back to the apostles, imparts a different skill. It's the skill of finding God amidst all the practices, in the doctrines, in the documents. It shapes a Christian's power of perception. If you can often wonder why our, many Protestant brothers and sisters love the Bible, but they don't see the Eucharist in John 6. It's because they don't, they're not living in the apostolic tradition. And they're living in a tradition that comes from the Reformation that blinds them to certain things in the New Testament instead of opening their eyes to those things. Okay? Now, I'm not saying this of every Protestant. I'm just saying, if you've noticed, many Protestants never see the importance of the Eucharist in the New Testament. It's because there's a tradition blocking their view and not the right tradition that helps them see that. Okay, so here's tradition then uh, from Blondel. It's a generational handing on of what is tacitly known by the community. It enables a person to see what the church sees. It includes writings, so in the tradition, there are writings. There's the writings of the saints, the writings of the fathers, the writings of the doctors. Uh, that's wonderful stuff. But there's also something that can't be put into writing. And that's the point I'm trying to clearly make to you now that we need to understand if we're going to understand 
the whole process and understand the church's devotion to tradition and the power of tradition. Okay? So, how about Vatican II? What does it do? What does it teach based on this philosophical, theological discovery of Blondel and on many who read Blondel like Congar? Well, we'll find out in the next video.